Welcome back to the Cinephiles. We have a very interesting topic today. It's called Roger Corman First. While we will briefly touch upon the career of Roger Corman, the focus of this episode is on those directors that got their start with Roger Corman and went on to bigger and better things. Uh, but before we continue that discussion, let me introduce you to our uh, criminal <laughs> element. Ooh, the guys wow. that make it happen. Uh, Jeff Galishaw. Lola Rock and Rolla, for whom hey everybody. this is her topic. She oh, yeah. came up with it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Roger Corman, as you know, is a hero, an absolute hero of mine because he gave you know directors that didn't have a lot of experience, like maybe one student film or one film that didn't make that much money, budgets to like move on and become bigger directors. Um, without Roger Corman, Roger Corman is one of my favorite producers of all time, and without Roger Corman, uh, we wouldn't have any of the great films of the 70s and 80s. As you know, he discovered everyone, and it, as opposed to having like a film school film, um, you know, uh, you got to get a budget, you had to make a profit, and you know, things had to be a certain amount long, and that's kind of all he cared about. He cared about the poster, he cared about selling the film, and he cared about making a profit. He famously said to Ron Howard, who he gave his first directing gig to, like he did Scorsese and Coppola and Jonathan Demme and a bunch of other new, you know, Joe Dante, a bunch of new directors. Um, he famously said to Ron Howard, uh, if you do this well, you'll never have to work for me again. Well, he so, got his start, then he's like a male boy. Yeah. In like a major studio, I uh, worked his way up being a, like a script reader or something like that, um, and then left to do his own thing. Um, and and he initially started working for AIP, right under uh, mm -hmm. Samuel Z. Arkoff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he worked with them for a little bit. Then he started his own production company, and that didn't work out. So he returned to AIP, and eventually he he went back. He left AIP in the seventies and started his own company, which is now pretty famous. Which was at first New World Pictures, of course, yeah. And then he sold that. That became New Horizons and Concord Pictures. Yeah. Today's discussion is about directors who got their break with Roger Corman. Yeah. Not necessarily their first mm -hmm. films, but their their first films with Corman or films that where they made sort of a stamp while working for Roger Corman. Well, and these films were the first films where they could go, look at the profit I've made on this film, so now I can make something bigger. Right. You know, yeah. because he never really lost money. I mean, the, his only his biggest regret was not producing um, Easy Rider because he had already done The Trip, he had already done a couple films about bikers. What about The Intruder? That was his passion project and that lost money. So oh, that's he never true. did a film like that again. It's an amazing film. Yeah, it's one of uh, William Shatner's early performances. Oh. <laughs> it's a serious movie about racism, uh -huh. and it's a it's a really good little film. Yeah, yeah. Let's start off with the first film, like the earliest film in our discussion, Francis Ford Coppola's uh, Dimension Thirteen. Sure. Not his first film. He made softcore porn. Oh, no kidding. Before that, but he was Not assisting. Happy. He was assisting uh, Corman a couple of productions. They were shooting a film. It was sort of a rip off off of Grand Prix, which is, was a film that came out at the time about car racing and all that stuff. Uh, turned out that uh, Corman saved some money from. He had some money left over from that project. He gave it to Francis Ford Coppola. Said, "Write a script, make it like Psycho, and I'll give you the rest of this money. Take the same cast from this movie you just worked on mm -hmm. and make me a movie." Yep. Just as long as you have, you know, the requisite amount of violence and suspense, you know, blah, 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 blah. Which is kind of awesome. I mean, as a director, like, I wish that there were more Roger Corman's around right. to be like, yeah. do whatever you want to. Here's your budget. Make sure that there's this many boobs in it and this much violence and make a profit. Exactly. And, well, this one, this was the 60s, so there were no boobs. Yeah. But <laughs> Not till the 70s. there was the violence. And so he made this film and <laughs> Corman saw it. He was like, what the Fuck. It was <laughs> yeah. a new artsy film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was like a student, so they had a, a falling out. He, yeah. he actually went and like re edited and redirected some stuff and added some stuff to the script. Right. Um, but Dementia 13 <sighs> is, is <laughs> the only black and white film we're discussing as well. Yeah. It, it was meant to be a rip off of a psycho, but like most films of the period that were that were inspired by or wanted to rip off psycho, they were actually more inspired by Les Diabolique. Then they were Psycho. Psycho well, that's itself where Psycho uh, came had from. derived some inspiration mm -hmm. from yeah. uh, Lay Dabble Week. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a crazy film. No. It's a weird film. It's, it's sleepy, man. I mean, some is. parts, it wears its budget Boring. on its, you know, it's, it's like you see it's a cheap film. Right. But there's elements, and I gotta tell you, the whole first, 
it, just to give you an idea what the plot is, just stop me if you've heard this one before, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> A uh, group of people converge on a family estate, you know, there, there's a history of mental illness, blah, 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 blah. Uh, one of the characters is the, is the wife of one of the sons, and the film opens, and, and I'm not really spoiling anything. It's an um, scene. Yeah, the, the <laughs> husband winds up uh, dying of a heart attack, and so instead of, like, trying to help him, the wife pushes him into the water, into the lake, and tries to hide the fact that she, he's dead so that she can gain from an inheritance, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's kind of the setup. And in, in, meanwhile, there's a psycho killer on the loose, right? Now, I think there are aspects where the film is beautifully shot. Yeah, I think so, and too. And there's a magnificent sequence, which is a nice bit of bait and switch, where the, the character who you think is the lead, which is the wife of this guy who's died, is trying to do this thing where she swims into the pond and she's we trying to find the body. Scene. Right, <laughs> and there's a nice little surprise when she comes up out of the water, which I won't give away, that is very well done. Mm -hmm. It's very creepy. Uh, but then there's like insane, insane stuff in there. Uh, yeah, he needs yes. to be reeled mm -hmm. in a little bit, you know, or needed to be reeled in a little <laughs> well, bit. Well, so. yeah, and the acting is all over the place. And the yeah. whole film is like dubbed. You yeah. know, it is? It, yeah, it was obviously done. Everything was looped in post. And See, stuff I, like I that. like that stuff. Uh, yeah. The great Patrick uh, McNee, McGee, he plays the, the local doctor, the family doctor, who's well, like a detective over, of the story. Well, he overacts just as much as he did. He, he, <laughs> well, the funny thing is, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but he comes across as more psychotic than it's, psycho. Especially yeah. when he keeps repeating right. the nurse. Like, like, like he winds up stumbling upon, somehow stumbling, stumbling <laughs> upon an important clue, and his reaction to it is so sociopathic. It, I can see sitting through a slow film if it's going to be worth it in the end. But even with the crazy ending, it wasn't worth sitting through. Out of all the films we watched today, this was the one where I sat there and I would not have thought, oh, this guy's on to something. He's going, he has a future. I just really didn't like this movie. I was bored out of my mind. And it's under 90 minutes and I was still bored. The title sequence I think is fantastic. The uh, shots, I mean, a lot of the shots done. were good. Some the story great shots, is crap. But, but you The know. story is just so confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really I like, got confused. I just sat down and tried to map out the plot of the story. And to be fair, a lot of these films kind of had very confusing plot oh, yeah, structures. Yeah. <laughs> But it, most of them have stuff there such that such just doesn't make any sense it, when you it, think it, about it. Exactly. You know, distract me at least. Yeah. <laughs> so dementia thirteen is no conversation, nor <laughs> <laughs> is it a one from the heart. There was another debut. It's not a film that we were assigned to watch, but we should mention Targets, Peter Bogdanovich's first film, which oh, he did for Roger yeah. Corman. Yeah, I like that film. Which is a really? nice little film. Uh, Boris Karloff basically plays himself, plays an aging B movie actor. And it deals with a sort of, a, I don't know, a Kent State type, you know, shootist um, who's obsessed yeah. with Boris Karloff or as an Charles actor, Whitman. as a character. Or Charles, yeah, 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 that's right. And so, and that's an interesting film. It's different, it's unique to Roger Corman's period because it's not an exploitation film. Mm -hmm. Although it's probably promoted as such. There isn't, there aren't those elements you associate with, with, with exploitation. It's actually a serious drama thriller. Martin Scorsese's Boxcar Bertha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, we had discussed this in our Martin Scorsese episode some time back, but Jeff wasn't a part of that episode, nor was yeah. Lola. So mm -hmm. this is, we, we can get their thoughts on Boxcar Bertha. I like Boxcar Bertha. Is it one of the best Martin Scorsese films? No, no. it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's no raging bull. But, you see, but, uh, I guess sort of like Dementia 13, unlike Dementia 13, this one I could see the promise, <laughs> at least. I saw this is a director who has an eye. And even John Cassavetti said after he saw the film that he, you spent a year making a piece of shit. It's not a bad film, but you're better than this. Right. right. It should be explained that Box Hard Bertha came about uh, off the heels of the success of like Arthur Penn's Bonnie and Clyde. Suddenly mm -hmm. everybody mm -hmm. wanted to do a 1920s uh, Prohibition era gangster, gangster piece, movie. Right? Yeah. Or Prohibition or I should say Depression era actually because these took place in the 1930s. And uh, he had uh, Big Bad Mama mm -hmm. came out mm -hmm. first, yep. right? And that was so successful he wanted to do another one. And so they did research and there was an actual person known as Box Hard Bertha uh, and so he, this was not uh, Martin Scorsese's first film. His first film was a little independent film called Who's That Knocking at My Door, mm -hmm. which, which established his relationship with Harvey Keitel at the time. Corman liked that film so much, he offered him the chance to make Boxcar Bertha. And it, it's an interesting film. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely of the, you know, couple on the run, 
1930s Dust Bowl kind of situation, although this focuses more on trains. But you have decent performances. Barbara Hershey. Naked uh, a lot. <laughs> naked a lot. <laughs> very very attractive. Yeah. Uh, you have David Carradine playing the other lover. His father, John <laughs> Carradine. In yeah. Uh, is in the film John Carradine used to play who took over from Bela Lugosi playing Dracula and all the universal horror films oh right? yeah that's right, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> among other things uh, also showed up in The Howling later on right yeah mm -hmm. uh, but and Scorsese has a cameo in it during the Bordello sequence but that's always cute when he does that like a <laughs> taxi driver yeah, it's, it's, little it's always cute when he shows cameo. up in a Bordello <laughs> sequence <laughs> yeah I'm always as a, 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 a customer so what do you guys think of Boxcar Bertha I thought it was long and good. I mean, you know, again, it's these are like, you know, really take a budget, make a profit. You know, um, I mean, he got to use like real actors, you know, successful actors. The production values like, are actually pretty good for yeah, a low-budget yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, does, it didn't feel cheap when you watch it. Yeah. I enjoyed it more than I expected to. Yeah. I mean, I the styled shots. Uh, it has the requisite exploitation again, nudity and of violence. And, but it still, but at least he found a way to make it make sense in, in the story and just not be gratuitous to be gratuitous. Well, and it definitely you could feel his love of gangsters too, <laughs> which you know is one of my favorite things about him as a filmmaker. Anyway, is his absolute love of gangsters. Right. I, I I think Boxcar Bertha is a very good film. Not a great film, right? Mm -hmm. But it's an interesting part of this. It's certainly nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, Roger Corman movies, they're film school. They're film school movies. These are these are directors that have budgets that they have to deal with for the first time. And, you know, most of them low. And then they have to meet certain criteria to get it uh, distributed. This is film school, you know? Now, now, when you see something like Boxcar Bertha being, like, a fan of Corman stuff like that, do you ask yourself, what's the thought process here? Okay, gangster movie, 1930s period, probably more expensive than contemporary. We need trains. You know, like, did you sit there and say, like, how do they pull this off? Right. Because I'm going to have that question for the next film we're going to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, in terms of, but in terms of this, you know. You mean how did they sell it? Or? Yeah, like, how they sell it. I mean, I know, like, with the AIP, you know, Edgar Allan Poe stuff, they right. tend to reuse the same costumes yeah, over and over course. again. Yep. A lot of stuff was shot in Europe, so they had access to that. Right. So kind of like the Hammer films. Right, right. You know, but but how do you get, you know, I just, like, I watch <laughs> Box Hard Bertha, and, and I'm like, okay, how do you green light this? I get it that 1930s gangster picks are popular. Right. But they're popular because they were made by big studios that had the budget for costuming. Well, Roger Corman wasn't a real details guy <laughs> yeah, as far as that's concerned. Like right. For him, it was really like bottom line of how he was going to sell stuff, you know, much like... Um, you know, Ed Wood's type of filmmaking, you know, it was really just, it doesn't really matter what goes in it, it just matters that they will buy it. You know what I mean? Right. And so I think that that's another thing that was really good for these young directors is they were giving, given all this freedom to do what they wanted to. Right. And experiment, and sometimes completely fail, and sometimes succeed. And that's why a lot of these films have, like, scene, you'll see one scene, and you're like, wow, that's a great scene, and then the next scene has nothing to do with what you just saw, right. and it's <laughs> terrible, you know, because these are, um, you know, chances to experiment with tiny budgets where, you know, the stakes are, like, high for these young directors, right. but not as high as when they're dealing with, you know, whatever their next film is going to be, you know? Did did Grand Theft Auto come out at the same time as K Sheet? Yeah, was sure. one before or the other? K was seventy two, and I can't remember when Grand Theft. So Auto Grand Theft Auto, I think, was later than that. So yeah. let's let's talk about K Sheet <laughs> first. Okay? Let's do Jonathan that. Demi's K Sheet. This is a film that has a series called Falling for a couple of reasons. Boobs, yeah. boobs, lots yeah, of boobs. Plenty. Well, not really, He's not gorgeous. really, because there's plenty of women in prison films from that period that do the exact same thing. That's not why the film has a cult following. The reason why this film has a cult following is because. Jonathan Demme put in a lot of political, feminist that is true. Uh, yeah. commentary that did not exist in that subgenre of exploitation film at the time. In fact, uh, this, John, this was Jonathan Demme's first directing gig for Corman. He had produced for Corman prior mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. Again, The Hot Box, mm -hmm. he produced that, Another Woman in Prison picture. He had an idea with a script that he brought to Corman. Corman didn't really like it. Uh, so he wrote this script for uh, his own idea for women's in prison film. At that time, Corman thought, yeah, but the women in prison genre was being played out. Mm -hmm. So with his own money, Jonathan Demme made this movie. Mm -hmm. Corman wasn't involved. It wasn't until he made the movie, completed it, then he showed it to Corman, and Corman agreed to distribute it mm -hmm. for him. Your typical exploitation cast, Erica Gavin used to star in the Vixen movies, you know, for uh, Russ Mayer. You have uh, Cheryl Rainbow Smith, who wound up becoming a porn star. Yes. Barbara Steele. And the famous Barbara, the, the great Barbara Steele, uh, B-movie queen, 
uh, you know, who's been in everything from Shivers to Black Sunday, you know, and this film. She plays a rather interesting prison warden. Yeah. <laughs> a crippled pr prison warden, yeah. somewhat sadistic. Somewhat. <laughs> but reserved. Yeah. But what makes this film interesting, yes, it has the standard elements, violence, nudity, lots of nudity. Boobs. However. I like the slow pan when they're in the shower, just boobs, 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 boobs. boobs. Demi does a very interesting thing, and this is what I think is interesting about the film. He does something kind of subversive. When he shows nudity, it's like girls sitting on toilets. Yeah. Yeah. Or looking miserable. Yeah. Or eating food. Yeah. You know, he does everything he can possibly can to deglamorize and, and like unexploit. Right. All the things he was contractually committed to putting in this movie. Right. Mm -hmm. Now do I think it's a good movie? I think there's I think there's some really entertaining stuff in it, and I think there's some really like really hard to watch stuff. Oh god it, yeah. Where you really roll your eyes. But it's interesting in that there's this almost naive feminist girl power message behind it. <laughs> which he's which kept. It's so yeah. naive and sweet that you kind of like go for it in a weird kind of way. Because I like how he sets up all the cliches. Like you have like the badass prison mate who's usually set up to be the bad guy. Right. Mm. She's usually the main antagonist. Right. And usually like the heroine or whoever's the heroine has to go up against her. Usually they have to have a shower sequence together. Of course. You know? And then they have a fight. A real rapey mm -hmm. and, and then eventually this person has to be, like, you know, vanquished, right? Well, the nice twist in this is that they become friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they actually start to work together, you mm -hmm. know, and they all come back to save their other fellow, yep. you know, woman and all that stuff. And, and, and there's some moments that are very nicely done. It feels like a verite film. Mm -hmm. And there's some stuff where it's just like, oh, this is obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> Ridiculous. And, and it, the biggest thing I found interesting about this film is like he structured it like a porn movie. Like seriously, <laughs> where you'd have a scene where the girl would like go into a room and she's starting, you know, that would be the scene where, oh, she's having sexual fantasies. And then that would like segue into a big masturbation scene uh, yeah. or a fantasy sequence where she's having hardcore sex. Right. But instead, it segues into these weird Freudian yeah, yeah, yeah. Up dreams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. dream, right? terror. Like the yeah. whole thing with Barbara Steele. You yeah, think yeah, yeah. masturbate. And then suddenly it's like her, you know, doing the song and dance number uh -huh. in front yeah. of all the prison mates. Yeah, I like that, you know, um, there are some uh, Demi-isms that he's kept for other yeah. things. Like, you get all this information during the opening title sequence, which he did again in Silence of the Lambs, where you get all this information about what's about to happen, and then it's the end of the credits. Right. He did the same thing here, like a whole story, uh, you know, of one of the lead heroines in this. You learn her entire story before the credits are done, and so right. that's really cool. Um, his use of music, you know, that blues music that he uses when they Just escape. to interrupt you for a second, also like how the heroine, usually the cliche is it's an innocent girl that's put in jail yeah. for a crime, a crime she didn't commit. Yeah. And this one, no, she no, she's not. Yeah, she absolutely she is. is. She is guilty. Yeah, yeah. And I like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that he kept. You know, his mm -hmm. whole feminist stance, he's always kept that, you know. Right. Um, he's also uh, really good about, uh, you know, actors that aren't white having strong roles that don't degrade them. He's kept that right. through his entire career as well. I also like how he has a mixture, of, not just a mixture of races, but a, a mixture of sort of ages. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which you don't usually see in women in prison. Yeah, films. oh, absolutely. It's usually young, hot babes. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, uh, or MILFs. Yeah. You know, but... Well, and it's also like, instead of just completely exploiting them, you can tell that they're miserable, like the, you know, the woman that would right. used to scream and now she's got a lobotomy or whatever they did to her. You know, exactly. I mean, they, they show, you know, the pain of the women in prison, not just them soaping each other up in the shower or whatever, right. you know, which I'm sure... Corman probably pushed as much as possible, you know what I mean? Right. So, you know, but his use of music, you know, like music that you haven't heard before during the escape and things like that, you know, he's kept that throughout his whole career. And again, this is the Roger Corman Film School, and so... I think it was a... John Cale did yeah, the music John for Cale this? John music. Cale did the music for yeah. this, right? Yep. Oh, and he used the same DP that he's used his entire career, too. Tak Fujimoto. Fujimoto. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you'd not know that from this film. <laughs> because, you know, honestly, it feels like a first film. It, it, there it parts of it are too, very know. sloppy. Yeah, yeah. There oh, parts yeah, are really well, sloppy. But there are some nice shots in there. Yeah. Here there. Yeah, throughout the film. I mean, that's why it's a fun film, but half the time I was rolling my eyes at some of the things. Like, when they escape, they go to, instead of like a massage parlor, it's a wrestling. Uh, yeah. uh, I was just like, okay, yeah. never seen that before. Oh, that or even funny. like the ending, for instance. It's like, well, I know, spoilers. But you know, like, 
they the, here you have all these sharpshooters. They can shoot the tires, but they can only shoot the like the warden and the crazy doctor, but couldn't like even wound any of the escape prisoners. Right. Yeah, and I was just like, this is ridiculous. But I mean, it I do works. have that seventies device <laughs> of the freeze frame for the last credits. <laughs> I, I was just, just like, that. oh my god! <laughs> okay. But I mean, it's a fun film. I mean, and out of the ones we've seen, it was one of the better. One of the better well, ones. Well, it's one of the ones that strives to be better. Yeah. I, I don't. It just depends on how you define better. Better in <laughs> the, the fact that it didn't bore you. To in tears. some ways, that's no. what almost works against this film. That it's trying to be more than just an exploitation film. Right. And yeah. sometimes it's so naive that it should just message, embrace. It kind of doesn't help the film in some ways. Right. Some ways, it's like just embrace exploitation. Right. So now we go on to Grand Theft Auto. Right. Uh, <laughs> this one surprised me the most because I actually had the most fun watching this film mm-hmm. because no offense to Ron Howard he's you know over the years he's gotten better and there's even a few films of his I like but this to me with all the car crashes and all the I guess random comedy this was to me like a great John Landis film that John Landis never made <laughs> yeah this is an interesting thing about Grand Theft Auto uh, Ron Howard was already a star yeah, yeah. you know Happy Days the uh, Andy Griffith show the whole thing and he had already directed TV up at this point. He had started directing TV episodes and things like that. Uh, he initially came to Corman with a project. He knew if he could make a film, make his film debut with anybody, it would be with Roger Corman. And initially, Corman made a deal with him. Look, I'll have you star in this film, which turned out to be Eat My Dust, mm-hmm. if you direct this film, which became Grand Theft Auto. Now, I want to go back to what I was going to say before. <laughs> no. We're talking about the sex, the violence, all uh-huh. that stuff, make sure these elements are in a movie. Of all the films we watch, this is this the most chaste Roger Corman film. Exactly. It's almost yeah. like a TV movie. Yeah, yeah. there's no breasts. <laughs> there's barely any swearing. Well, I think that that's because of the deal. You know, Ron yeah. Howard agrees to be in this film, and then he makes this and film. And apparently, you know? uh, it was a huge success. Yeah, they made a, a lot huge, of money huge, They made a lot of money off of this film. Grand Theft Auto is a love story. With cars. Now... Going back to the other thing I was going to say when I asked you the question about how do you think they budgeted this, you know, with, you know what, where do they think, oh, period detail, the fucking amount of cars they demolished, including a Rolls Royce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would have been twice the budget of something like Boxcar Birth. Yeah. So, and I don't think this movie cost a lot of money. And I'm just like watching this and, Christ almighty, what resources they had to get away with some of this. Well, I mean, well, some of the cars that they crashed didn't look that expensive at the beginning with, like the pickup truck, the, um, I think the other truck, I don't remember which character was driving. Was, they had a couple of police cars, they had, they had a whole, like, stock car well, yeah, derby they, thing. They had know? the modified police car with the preacher chasing the guy. Right. And, um, but, I mean, to me, I don't know. To me, it looked mod, I could see, you know, what you're talking about. I think he got away with it just because Ron Howard was famous already. Exactly. You know, I think... he could call in favors. Yeah, so no, I mean, All right. Then that must be it. I, I, know, I, I, know, I, don't, like, I know this is low budget. No, God. but Corman's bottom line was always money. And if, yeah. you know, Ron Howard was famous already, he probably gave him probably, more allowances so probably than other directors. Because yeah. I don't know what the actual budget... I know it wasn't a lot. Well, well, that's also why... I it figured. was also... I should say... You could crash cars back then a lot cheaper than you could crash cars now, though. Oh, we should go back in time. <laughs> look at the I know, financing right? reward. Well, look at the Blues Brothers. They would have do, done all CGI or whatever now for that kind of shit. Oh, yeah, shit. exactly. Yeah. I was going to say that was also a bit of a family affair because you also have uh, his brother, Clint Howard. Clint and Howard. His, his and his father, father, Rance Howard. Who also co-wrote the film oh, with really? him. Yeah. Oh, really? I didn't know he co-wrote it. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. But I figured that's why you got so many cameos. Like, you have Gary Marshall mm-hmm. in the film. You have Marion Ross. Marion Ross. Boss. I didn't recognize it at first for some reason. <laughs> as soon as I heard her speak, I was like, that's Marion Ross. I that, just that's went. really funny. And and what's his name? The guy who plays the radio host who would turn up in a lot Oh, of Don parts. Steele. Don Steele. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In one of my favorite Roger Corman films, Death Race 2000. Oh, yeah. He's awesome in that. <laughs> Basically playing the same character. But, but you know, and it's such a really dumb, simple plot. Pretty you know? much. But that's why I figure also, even though he stars in the film, realistically, he doesn't have to do anything but stay in the back seat throughout the most of the film. Yeah. He has a few lines, but if you notice, mostly... It's uh, the girlfriend who talks. He just right. Oh, no, it was the easiest directing gig for him. You know, if you think about it, it was actually pretty clever. All I have to do is sit in this car and respond to my fiance. Exactly. That's it. <laughs> so the next film, <laughs> the next film is probably the most seen 
how the films we're going to discuss. It's fantastic. It's it's uh, it's not his first film. <laughs> His first, th- th- this next director is Joe Dante. Yes. The first film he actually did was Hollywood Boulevard. Oh yeah, that's and he right. did that with Alan Arkush, right? Mm-hmm. They were they like they kind of direct that together. We couldn't get our hands on it, <laughs> so we decided we opted for talking about Piranha instead. Also, the it's more fun to talk Piranha. about Piranha. Yeah. <laughs> A movie which was remade twice, actually, once for Showtime by Roger Corman himself oh, in the nineteen nineties, okay. and then the Just Alexandra uh, Alexander yeah. Asia film, you know, which is terrible. The 3D one. Oh, I saw that Wait. in the theater. Though. We discussed that in our grind, Neil Grindhouse. I was really, oh, well, I, I didn't hate it. Yeah, yeah you did. I, I thought it was terrible. I was really drunk <laughs> for it. I saw it at midnight in a theater, and that was kind of fun. I like the fake boob. Yeah, yeah I mean, I could see where, like, like, if you're really, really drunk. You well, should I be. was sober, sure. and I enjoyed no, it. No, yeah, you should be at least on, at least drunk, if not on mushrooms. But the original is a hell of a lot of fun. It's a film that's. Even Steven Spielberg said was the best Jaws ripoff. Ever. Oh my god, it was amazing! And and they, you know, if you see the trailer, it's a total ripoff of Jaws, which is awesome. It is, yeah. and it isn't. It does its own thing. Oh, of course. You know, it yeah. starts off that way, and then it just does its own thing. And they 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 did made the agreement with uh, Corman. They gave it the boobs. The boobs uh-huh. are in there. Yeah. Oh, the violence. It's definitely. Oh, in there. there's so much good blood. Too. And it's it's, it's quite a Joe blood. Dante film. When you see it, it's like this is a Joe Dante. Oh film. yeah. It written really by John joke. Sales. Written by the great John <laughs> Sales, who would also uh, team up with John Joe Donne later on Howling. He wrote the Howling oh, okay. as well. Uh, but yeah, and you have Bradford Dillman as sort of the hero. <laughs> Just love the name Bradford, Bradford Dillman. Dillman. You got like cameos by Kevin McCarthy. You got you know Paul Bartel again, of who appeared in Grand Theft Auto, who also directed Death Race 2000 for Corman, one of my favorite Corman films. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's a lot of fun. This oh, movie. it's so oh, it's silly fun. and great. Yeah. I mean, it's so much mm. fun. It's so B campy, yeah, fantastic. It. And Joe Dante's so funny with his directing and stuff too. He really knows how to cheese it up. I love that guy. He has his like left field moments. Like like I I saw uh, a recent documentary on Harry Harry uh, Ray Harryhausen. Sorry, Ray Harryhausen, the great special effects guy, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, where Joe Dante was interviewed. And he, there's that scene where they're in the lab, where they discover how, like, the, the, the piranhas were genetically, you know, modified, whatever. And there's that weird moment where you see this, like, stop-motion creature mm-hmm. walking through the lab. And Joe Dante, that wasn't in the script. Dante just wanted a Ray Harryhausen moment. Yeah. And he's like, I don't care if it doesn't make any sense. I just want a Ray Harryhausen. Someone who does stop-motion. Can I get someone to do stop-motion, like, animation? Because it's I want to do cool. that just for the scene. I like it. It's cool. I don't care if it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So that's why it's in the film. The fake boob shot where she, uh, to escape, she reveals her breast to the soldier. But it's obvious a body double. Yeah. And it's just so sloppy. But it's funny. And it fits uh, the whole movie. Um, and who's the older actor who got his legs in, uh, his character got his legs Oh, Keenan Wynn. Yes. Uh, Keenan uh, Wynn of all people is exactly. in this Exactly. And just like his character, apparently he was drunk the whole time he was all acting right. in the film. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it has a downbeat ending for a tongue-in-cheek sci-fi but, horror. But that's what stays with you after right. all this. Right, it's <laughs> weird. It's kind of jarring, but, jarring, but it's it kind of works the film. I'm a big fan of Piranha. So yeah. am I. I'm not so much a fan of its sequel. Piranha 2 The Spawning which gave James, James Cameron, Cameron his which story. I have never oh, seen yeah. to this day oh yeah and, and, I saw that when I was and Lance smalling. Henriksen this his first Poor leading Lance role you know, established a relationship with him and James Cameron you know uh, but it's it's terrible <laughs> did you ever meet Corman? I have met Corman I was freaking out. I was working on Manchurian Candidate, which was uh, directed by Jonathan Demme, and it was Meryl Streep and Denzel Washington, and everyone was like, ah, Denzel! And I cornered Roger Corman and gave him my film, Dragzilla, and was freaking out over him, and he looked at me like I was a crazy person. <laughs> but it was just a really, like, sweet... It's the same when you meet, like, Lloyd Kaufman. Yeah. You know, all these guys that do all this exploitation stuff, of course, they're perverts and stuff, but they're actually... I mean, he's just a really sweet guy. You know, and, and he, you know, he was a big part of of why we have great films. Yeah, you know, was. And these films are not, well, they're great to me, but to people that aren't obsessed with B-movies, they might not be thought of as great films. But these directors wouldn't have been able to show, right. oh, I can make The Godfather now because I made this and it made a profit. So that ends our discussion on Roger Corman first. Uh, check us out on Twitter. Check us out on uh, Google+. Plus. Check us out on uh, Facebook. we got a Facebook group. It's very popular. A lot of discussions going on. And uh, most importantly, check out Unfinished Business B1 Twitter account. Yeah, Unfinished B1. Check out the Unfinished Business Facebook page. 
Uh, and check out the blog. The blog, cinephiles, tv.blogspot.com. Exactly. And yeah. check out all of our content that's now at uh, thisisinfamous.com. We're now firmly a part of the family. They're a cool bunch of cats. We enjoy working with them. Very supportive. There's a lot of great content other than the cinephiles on that website as well. I encourage you to check that out. And give us some feedback. Let us know what you think. You know, and respond to the comments section of Please. whatever page Please. our video is embedded on. And with that, I bid you adieu. In the course of this calamitous chase of the chapel, Rams caused the crashing of a $40,000 Rolls Royce, three Cadillac, Mercedes Benz, Porsche, seven cop cars, four trucks, a very cherry van, a lot of Lincolns, low riders, 33 screaming street machines.